My name is Stephen Barson. Uh, I'm one of the composers of Star Wars Jedi Survivor. And today uh, we are going to be talking to some of the people who were involved in making the score and the people who were integral to the sound of the soundtrack and how great it sounds. So I'm thrilled to be joined by Simon Chamberlain. Uh, Simon is one of the busiest session players in London. Uh, he's very well known for his work with George Fenton, uh, amongst other composers. And, uh, and Simon, really, thank you for taking the time to be here. Pleasure. So, going back to your early days as a pianist, um, where did you first start taking lessons? How did how did you become? <clears throat> well, my dad was well? a, a musician, organist, pi pianist, choir master, um, and he'd had lessons with a, an old lady in Mansfield. There were three sisters, three old ladies, uh, and I got a, I, I got an aptitude for it, and I started playing it about four or five, and you, I could sort of do it. And so it was, was probably about six or so then when I started going for lessons with Miss Nellie Housley, who taught my dad and also taught John Ogden, who was uh, the famous John Ogden. Uh, I mean, the, the three old sisters were very old old school, and I learnt an amazing amount of from having years with her. Uh, she was very much from the old Kodai method of taffetiffy, evenness. Everything was just Bach, Mozart and Beethoven for about 10 years. We never got near anything which wasn't in time, you know, which was good because 20 years later I could play with the click and it did me good. Um, so that that was my early years of playing the piano and I, I and I, <clears throat> I was, it's about the only thing I was, I was good at really. It was, it was, I had an aptitude and, and I, I loved it. So it became, it was easy for me to do. And, um, I did that piano lessons for 10 years, then in my teens I just wanted to do other things and play other things and expand and play jazz and play pop and, and it went from there really. So when did you first get into session work as a pianist? I mean, how did that come about? I'd had the fortune before I went to university of meeting at a holiday camp, a guy called Keith Grant who was the big chief in chief engineer at Olympic Studios in its heyday, in its, in its pomp, a marvellous eccentric of a man. And I'd met him, and um, to cut a long story short, when I, when I came, finished university, I came to London for a year and met him again. He remembered me, and I was living just for a year very close to Olympic, and he said, look, he said, why don't you come and uh, practice the piano in Olympic, because I'd never piano, and, uh, and I'll introduce it to people. And I used to, used to go in and listen to sessions at Olympic. And he'd, he'd ended, uh, then he'd go next door and he'd say, come and play the piano. And he'd bring people in and say, this is my friend Simon, he's, he plays all sorts, you know. And then I went on the, I went away for a year and a half on the cruise ships, playing every night on a band, which was brilliant. It was great. It, 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 to be playing six nights a week, we were playing jazz, you were playing cabarets, you were reading charts that acts brought on. It was the perfect way to get experience in Dubai. I could have done it anywhere else. And we did a, a year, a, six months in, in England and then went back on the ship for a second time. When I finished, I went back to London. I was going to start trying my hand at living there and doing stuff. And um, I saw Keith again. I went back to see Keith, who's at Ted come and practice piano. And, and he introduced me to people and used to let me go and watch sessions because I was absolutely set on wanting to like a life in the music business because when i was four, about 14 or 15 i'd read an article in the melody maker which talked about session musicians and how they just turned up they played for the morning and they did something recorded something and in the afternoon they did something different and it sounded just a great job and that's what and i wanted to be one well, i thought well this is a i love to get into the recording business in london and i came back to see keith and um We'd, 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 he'd let me play things and he recorded, he'd say, let's do a recording. We did a demo cassette tape and he sent it off to John Barry and then the next thing I was, I got a Bond film from him and I was on, I was suddenly sitting in the studio doing a Bond film, you know, and knowing George Fenton was, the, that was one thing that made me, uh, there are various things that made me want to join this business. George took me at, Keith asked me to come into a session, and I went to the session and watched the watched through the window as the musicians there, and it was a small, it was a group for a TV series, and it was a few strings, a few bit of wind, saxophone, guitar, bass, and drums, and it was written and was being conducted by a bloke wearing a black t-shirt and a pair of jeans. And I thought this the man's written this. He's in the studio, and he's he can dress it any way he wants to. And I thought, that is brilliant. That is a job for me. And that was George. And I got to know George, and I got to work with George, and then we've been friends, and I've done things with him in the last 35 years. And that's how it started, I thought. And so one of the, A, that you're mixing with fantastic musicians, B, you're in great places, the, 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 the sense of humour in musicians is brilliant, you work with fantastic orchestras, you do great scores for people. 
And most importantly, you can wear exactly what you want. So, uh, with this, speaking of George Fenton, he's someone you've collaborated wo- with a lot. How did the um, the piano framed come about that that album? Well, after many many years of working with George and playing and working with him on his film scores, his TV series, all sorts of stuff, we were just in the studio one day, we were doing something, and he said. He said, you know, there's so much stuff I've got that isn't really, hasn't really been put down. And he said, why don't you just do, try do a few tracks and record some of the, well, pick what you want from the, you know, my repertoire. And so he'd got all the cues from all the various films. We said, we'll try that film, all these famous films, the you know, days, all these, these sort of films. Um, You've got mail, etc., oh, and, and and also more obscure things he'd done, like TV series, which had got a great tune, and and so we started. He started to send me the, what he got of all the cues, and I'd take the main theme, and then I'd look through the cues to to try and find things that I could to make a standalone piano piece. Because normally, the thing about film music is that you get a great tune, and then it get, turns into something else and fizzles out or goes. So you never really get a start and an end. It, it's not a complete piece ever. So that's what I, I did for about a year. I started putting these things together, and after about that, we 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 played through them. And he said, "This is great. Let's go and record it and let's make an album." And we did. We went and had, spent days in a studio with a lovely piano and and just did standalone piano pieces from all from lots of his repertoire. But well-known things and lesser well, lesser-known things. So we often separate the piano off into a booth for recording sessions for when when it's a, uh, a separate part or a solo part and things like that. Are there a particular? Is there a particular benefit to that? Is that something you prefer doing, or is it something you you prefer to be out in the room with the orchestra when you're playing? Oh, it's difficult that because a, a big Steinway in a, a tiny little box doesn't sound it's not great because it's not a big enough environment for it to sound great so you've got the thing on the lid and it's the half open and you're in a tiny little room and you sort of pressed against the wall so you're never going to make the instrument sound as it should that's a fact it needs some space mm-hmm. so in that respect it no it's not as good and also you're really you're not with the band you've got everything on the cans you've got your own little mixer so and you can the md doesn't even know you're there till the third day so um it's that sort of environment but what it doesn't mean is that if you mess it up, you'll, you don't have to, to, to apologise to the conductor and say, oh, sorry about that, any chance we could do so-and-so again? And the old orchestra go, oh, great, you know, you've cocked it up. Uh, so you can then say, look, the previous date was good, take that one, and they've got isolation. That's the good thing about it. You can always go into sound the break, look, I'll do that bit again, and nobody knows, and you just get on with it. When you're in the room, it's a different kettle of fish, because unless it's screened off and it's it's got pretty good protection from the orchestra, if you... <laughs> If you mess up badly, you've got to do it again. So you're in the room, but actually playing in the room with everybody is a different experience and a more enjoyable one. But it's it's it, horses for courses. Whatever the mu- it depends on what the music is and how they're trying to record it. Really. So was sight reading something you sort of consciously sort of like practice when you oh, were studying? Oh goodness gracious, yes, yeah. absolutely. I mean, you grow up playing great composers' piano pieces, and. It's something you've got to practice. You've got to keep fit with it because as soon as you don't do some, you don't sight read. Sight reading, it's no good sight reading pieces. You know that defeats the object. You've got to because my my dad left me mountains of music, of folios, of strange music by people you've never heard of. But you can open them up and you see you see something by somebody you've never heard of, which is sort of quasi sort of romantic or it's Victorian or something. But You've not seen it, and that's where you that's where you you have to start. Practice. You turn to the next page and try and do the next one, and then, because if you're not in the studio every day, you become rusty very quickly. The brain and the fingers don't. So, yes, sight reading is really important to to keep at it, even when you're not working in the studio, because it it's it, it's hard, and uh, you can get in you can get very rusty indeed. And suddenly, oh, I'm not reading this properly. So I do a lot of work just playing things that I don't know deliberately to keep practicing. So it's hard. It's hard, and it's sort of not always satisfying. But at least you your brain's ticking over. So for session music, we often don't have key signatures on the parts, uh, and often you know you you have lots and lots of accidentals to deal with. Um, how how is how is that as an experience? Do you, do you, do you prefer having key signatures, or is it is it easier with that? Not really, because. 
I mean, if you key signatures of things like songs or th things that mm -hmm. have got a, a, a set in a key, mm -hmm. songs and things, or jazz pieces or pop pieces, then you've got chord symbols and you've got key signatures, and, it, and you know where you are. Film, film music, particularly for example, you'll you'll you'll, you'll start with for, mm -hmm. um, your music. It, it's it's got a lot of polytonality, so you know that one section is playing in B flat, the next is in E, and this so it changes all the time, and it gives you that sense of no key center. For lots of lots of stuff, which is fantastic, but when you when you when you're doing film, it's it's it. We very rarely get a key signature unless it's a piece that's been written, for example, a waltz to go in a film. And then you'd give you because it to be obvious. But no, it's it, you, it, it. Very rarely you get a key signature on a piece of film music. Um, so when you're reading new parts, what what makes a great part? I mean, like what are what are the things that are you know that are great to see and that sort of make you happy? What 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 are the nightmares things that well, composers do sometimes? More and more these days, because we can do, we can ho hopefully have a look at the music before the sessions, and I think it's quite important to do that now because you you get more and more surprises on on piano parts than you used to. I mean, because people try things and they try different things, and sometimes it's Wow, that's difficult. So it's nice to just check through because then you don't want to get lumbered on the session. So that's one thing we have. A lot of the problems you get with a piano part, and I'm sure other players get in, comes from the lack of maybe the orchestration because mm -hmm. a great orchestra will know the instrument and know what's ca what you're capable of and know what's, what's reasonable to write, but how to write it as well. Mm -hmm. And when we did your, your gig... We had that three piano, which was which, and Gordy had, had already got three different ways of trying to play, it. and I got a fourth, a fifth way of trying to do it, and we talked about it because there is there's, there's going to be one way which is easier for people to read. What I what I've always I always tell orchestrators or copies or mainly orchestrators is that with a piano part, if you can get everything on one stave, if you're playing up here and you've got write it on one stave. If anything's in the bass, write it in the bass. If it can be on one stave, if it goes down there, you put it in the, you put the bass clap in. But if you can get things in one stave, write it in one stave. What people tend to do these days, it, it crops up now and again, they think, oh, I'll tell you what I'll do. There's, a, there's, a, there's an arpeggio in the right hand there, but it's still in the right hand. But I'll split the style, put another treble clef underneath. So it goes, diddly ding. And, and of course, you, you can't follow it because you're automatically looking at what you would normally be, be a bass clef. And, mm. it's, and it's in the right hand. So I, I, I sometimes think, oh, this should be in the right. So I'm busy writing the bits in, in the one stave that should have been in the first place. And it's only because people go, oh, it looks good. And that's quite trendy. And, but it's actually difficult, more, even much more difficult to try and sight read. So I always mm. say, keep things Sim as simple as you can. If it goes on one stave, your eye will look at one stave and you'll know where you are. That's so speaking of the three pianos, um, mm. is that the most you've had on a session? Or is it like, has anyone got ventured no, beyond no. three? It, I remember, I can't, I, there's a film we did years ago at Abbey Road. I think there were six on there, but it just no <laughs> orchestra, just the pianos in the, for a very moody film. Um, <laughs> but we had four on Hans Zimmer's Interstellar film, mm -hmm. which were we recorded over two or three days but just four pianos in a studio which was great fun just doing stuff and making it up and and following things and play which was marvelous so yeah, there have been four and i think of a four and a six so you're not <laughs> close to getting the record Excellent. we have yet. a new target no no <laughs> <laughs> but you can't fit them in with an orchestra you'll have to get the studio on its own <laughs> So on Jedi Survivor's score, we um, we asked you to put quite a lot of blue tack into the piano. Um, how often are you asked to do unusual things to the piano? And is it something you enjoy doing? Uh, or is it something that's a bit more of a nightmare than anything else? I did a, a, set, a film session and the orchestrator and the conductor, great magician, they wanted to use harmonics inside the piano, which means that, and it, my heart sinks when I see this, anything inside the piano means you've got to stand up You've got to put the stand down because you can't see. You can't see the music. You can't get it. And you, and then you have to mess around and he, 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 trying to find a harmonic because you you, you put the, the sustain pedal. Then you play it very gently and you have to get your finger to find out where, which harmonic they want and where it is. I mean, it's it's because inside a piano you don't know what the note is because it's just you know. And he kindly said, "Look, I've got. I wanted we want to use all these harmonics." And I, what he'd done, he'd, he'd been out and bought a sort of news agents or somewhere and bought these this book of little yellow and red round sticky things and he'd been it spent time on all the bottom and the, the middle of the piano 
at finding out where the harmonics that they want and sticking a little red and yellow dot on them. So he said, when we come to these cues, you'll know sort of whereabouts to put your finger as you play that. And I said, so, so well, great. You know, it was covered in these things. So that'll help me, that'll be great. I've been through it all. That's where the harmonics are. <clears throat> so the first cue comes up and it was like a full on thrash. It was like a car chase or something. Like, so, you know, it was like full on. And the piano, I just hammered the piano. <laughs> I was playing it. I can see all these little red and yellow bits of paper fluttering on the. We finished the cue and I looked in the piano and there was nothing on the strings whatsoever. <laughs> it was all in the pot of the piano. And that, I've sold after, that was it, end of story, you know. It got me off the hook. <laughs> Sorry, the, 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 it, all that time and it, it, they'd all bounced off the strings. For one M1, you know, whatever it was. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. But there are other things. People do like you to suddenly lean, sometimes lean in the piano and play. They'll write a, they'll write a, they'll write a, a glitch on the strings from there, you know, bottom ever something up to there on the on the thing. So they don't realise that you get about that far, and there's the the the, 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 the iron of the piano is in the way. You know, the the frame of the piano is clonk. So it's there are lots of things, and and I've had to be where I've had to get a timp stick and then try and find a note and gently do that on it. You know, because of course you don't know if you're the right one, and you do it, and it's the wrong note, or it it makes it. I hate it. <laughs> if you, you're better off just getting a, a sample CD of a, a piano <laughs> sample CD and finding the weird bits off it and using them to be perfectly honest and also it kills you back as well <laughs> so no I'm not in favour of ever getting my head in the lid of a piano and messing about all right <laughs> so um outside so outside of music uh you know what what's what what's what are your what are your hobbies? what do you like to do outside uh the two f's really fishing and football yeah, excellent I'm my team Mansfield Town, season so who, ticket holder who's there. Who's your team? Mansfield Town, I'm season ticket holder. Yeah. Uh, and my, I've got a little a fishing boat, I'll go out of Brighton and sea fish. And that's about it, really. <laughs> There's nothing much else. <laughs> Simple pleasures. Simon, thank you so much for taking the time. Just an absolute pleasure, as always. <laughs> it's been great. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Thanks.